Good morning. Hey, Doug. Good morning. Raymond is in the house. Landon is here. Landon. Landon, are you signed up? I didn't see your name on the roster. I was just looking. Yep, I am. Sweet. Caesar, I saw you uh, won that engineering contest. Please tell me about that really quick. Uh, it was nervous. It was nerve wracking presenting no it to the group. No yeah, kidding. Who else? Who else was in your group? Well, it started off with me and Landon. Uh huh. And then towards the end, it was just me. Got it. But it's very nerve wracking. What was your product? That's a some like a robotic glove that you put on your hand to help you with hand strength. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's really neat. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Hannah, nice to meet you. Hi. What's your, where are you coming from? I haven't met you before. Uh, Southern Oregon University. So you got it. Oh, we emailed a little bit, didn't we? That's right. Welcome. I think so. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I think we did. I think I sent you the code or something like that. David, nice to meet you. Thanks for emailing me and yeah. pointing out the errors in my syllabus. What's your background, David? Where are you from? Um, I live in Grants Pass. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm about to get my transfer degree. And then I'm going to go to U of O for physics. So oh, I'm a double major in math. Got it. Got it. And did you take Mary's calculus sequence this year? Is that where you've been? Yeah, I took, um, I took it last year. I took 251, 252, and 253 last year. But I've Got done a lot of review. Got it. I am not worried about it. And then I'm taking Calc for this term too. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you're piling it on. I don't know. Is anybody else doing that? Yeah. yeah I'm same here with Mary Middleton. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Well, maybe we can uh, <laughs> help each other out. This is a this is a cool um Discord server I can send you that a lot oh, of us. Sweet stem people are in that'd be great yeah i would highly recommend you guys connect offline discord's a great way to do that um, just checking over homework together those kinds of things it's really that's a really valuable thanks for sharing that in the chat raymond well cool welcome to differential equations i'm relatively I'm guessing I should say that you probably don't have a great feel for what this class really is. And that's part of what today is to kind of kick you off in that direction. It's uh, really cool. It's neat, neat, neat. And fortunately, it isn't, it isn't terribly dissimilar than things that you've already done. It's just kind of taking the, the object that you've been studying, looking at from this perspective and saying, well, let's tip it this way and look at it from a different perspective. And so it isn't, it isn't brand new. I've seen a lot of it in the engineering textbooks I have. Yeah, it's so super it's applicable. Look without knowing this. Yeah, it's super applicable to things. And that's why I'm kind of stoked to show it to you, because that's my bent as a mathematician. I like it when you can use it for something. And so I have three or four projects on the syllabus this term that'll uh, give you a chance to do that. And, and most of the time, I, I really want whenever I get projects, I really want everybody to get an A plus on them. I want them because I, because they're a learning opportunity. It's not, it's not something to put in the grade book to me. It's something to teach you something. And whether your help is from other classmates or from me, you know, I want to give you enough hints to you're like, Oh my gosh, I get it now. You know, maybe some of you need more and some of you need less. I don't care. Um, please. And I'll remind you of this, but you know, with respect to this class, all of you have made it this far in math and, and you need to get this stuff. Don't don't sit there in isolation. Hang out with other people in class. Hit me up outside of class, and uh, we can do one on one zooms um, pretty randomly, um, kind of all the time. I really don't. I, I I haven't had good luck setting up kind of an office hour in the past, just because of the I'm assuming because of the time limitation. You know, the fact that it's like a certain hour, and you know maybe you're busy or working or something of that nature. Um, so you're not, you know, not around during that time period. Um, 
but let's see. I'll write this up. I better do it now or I'll forget. I'm going to share a screen. So the basic structure of this class is I'm going to talk at you live like this. Um, to the extent that you are able, comfortable, and so forth, I'd love it. Everybody showed up face to face, showed up on screen. I mean, you have limitations. Maybe you're laying sideways in bed. I mean, I get it's early in the morning and all that, but I, but I really want this to be a conversation between all of us, and it makes it easier if, when you say something. If other people can connect your name to your face and so forth, and it kind of humanizes this a bit. Then I really don't want you to get lost in this class. Um, to that end. This is my cell phone number. And I give you that because I want you to text me and say, hey, can you Zoom for 10 minutes about question 22? I'm a little stuck. And it's amazing how little time it will take. If you've already put some thought into it, if we just pop it up and you kind of show me what you've done and what you've thought a little bit, you know, it just takes so little time. And I guess I, I don't do this. I don't do this for the money. I probably wouldn't do it for free. But I don't do this for the money. I do it because it's fun to understand. It's fun. It's neat material. And it's no fun for you not to get it. And it's extremely fun for me when you do get it. So for you to send me a text and keep in mind, I'm probably not going to store your number. So when you text me, I'm not going to know who you are. Um, but just say, hey, you got 10 minutes to Zoom. And if I'm out and about someplace and I, you know, I'll, I'll say, hey, I'll be home at 2.30. Can you do it then? And we'll just make a time and then we'll hop on and and do it. Um, that is no skin off my back um, to do that at all. And I, I think it's pretty fun. And I really want to connect with you a little bit one on one just because I think it'll help you to make sense of this material. This is just too good not to get. It's just too fun. Um, so stick that in your phone. A um, couple of quick other things just. Where did the syllabus go? I know I opened it. I guess I didn't open it. I don't know. Um, just with, with respect to the syllabus, I sent it to you a long time ago, um, but I did make some updates. Some things were updates um, based on mistakes. Like for instance, David pointed out, I made this first assignment due July 12th. Hey, today is July 12th. That'd be a bad day for it to be due. Um, but notice there's really six chunks of homework you're going to turn into me, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and these are mostly due according to the calendar down here, kind of when they need to be due, if you will. Obviously, I'm primarily concerned with you understanding everything you need before the first midterm next Thursday. Um, but pay attention to this schedule. Keep pretty close eye on that so that you know what is going on. The other thing I changed in here, if you if you happen to print the syllabus from, I don't know, a month ago when I originally sent it to you, um, I took 1.1's assignment off this. We're gonna talk about it today. I just don't wanna give an assignment on it. So the one that is posted in my open math, the one that I just sent you a couple of days ago, you know, that one's kind of up to date. I didn't make very many changes, but that's just a couple of little things that I, that I noticed. Um, I've seen about five of you jump into my open math, which is a free online homework site. Um, this particular class, there isn't any online homework though. This material is hard enough that it's actually the, the online versions of differential equations aren't really good enough yet to justify that. So every one of these questions you're doing here is out of the book. And I'm going to give you my, my solutions to these. I'm not just going to grade them and give them back to you and say, you know, B plus, like that doesn't really do a lot of good. Um, I'm going to send you my solutions to these so you can kind of grade your own in a sense and learn from it. That's the point of homework to learn from it. So you ace the test. Um, this grading scale is a little bit stressful, perhaps, because so much of the grade is coming from tests. But the design there is, you know, there's enough percent in your homework, 25 percent to make it worth your while. But if you bomb it, something in your homework, so what? Like learn from it. As long as you learn from it and then, you know, ace the test, I want you to get an A in the class. I mean, I want you to be able to get a C in your homework because you stunk it up practicing. But then because you bugged me, bugged each other, spent some time on this, thought about it, understood it. I'm not a hard tester. I give questions that are pretty much fastballs right down the center of the plate. 
for you baseball people. Um, so I don't, I don't want tests to be tricky. That's not my style. So if you make sense of this stuff, you shouldn't have a terrible time on the test. I think the last, the last test I gave in 253, it seemed like the last test I gave, the average on it was like 94% or something ridiculous like that. Really high. Um, the stuff is just neat. Let's see. So this is the info you need to get onto my open math. Let me show you what's in there now. So, you know, there's no homework in it, but what is in it? Why are we, why is it even in there? This is what you're going to see. So one thing that's a little helpful in there is there's a calendar that shows everything that's coming up. Um, which I'm not sure why test doesn't show up in your view, but I need to make sure that it does. But that'll maybe it'll just help you organize a little bit. Um, the Zoom link for the class every day is sitting in here, so it's maybe an easy place as soon as you have it kind of favorited and you don't have to log in every single time. Maybe that's an easy place to click into this class. Syllabus is in here. There's a whole bunch of formulas in this class that we're going to know before we're finished with this. Um, and so really there's one page of notes that we'll use for the final exam that's already sitting in there for you. And then every day, anything I write, anything I write, I'm going to post it every day. And I'm also going to post the lecture every day. So if you miss something or want to hear something twice, it'll always be in here. So we can't see uh, my labs plus, by the way, or my open math. We could see your own desktop. You see. Now, what do you see? Now, now we can see it. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I didn't That's know if, if, if you knew we couldn't or not. I did not know. I have two screens and I thought you could see the other screen. So I'm glad to know that now you can see it. Let's see. So, so there's a Zoom link in here for class every day. Um, I didn't post this another place, but also on the syllabus that I showed you a second ago. Actually, I'm gonna pull it up really quick just to show it to you here. So that's also the Zoom link for class, which is probably how you got to it today. But also office hours, this, this is the Zoom link. Like if you text me and say, hey, can we meet at two? And I say, yes, I'll see you in, the, I'll see you in there at two. That'll be at this office hour Zoom link. So we'll click in there. Um, so you may have saw my email about the book that I managed to screw up um, because I didn't, I've never seen a company do this before, so it's my mistake, but this is what the book looks like. And I went in online just to, so I could you know, send you guys a link to find this thing out there cheaply. And unfortunately the sixth edition looked exactly like this and that's what I saw. And so that's what I sent you. Um, how, how many of you, do a half of you or three quarters of you have the sixth edition right now, which is which is fine if you do. Because, um, if you have the eighth edition, then the homework questions that I gave you are great. But if you have the sixth edition and you go look for those homework questions, it's not going to work. And so I'm assuming I'm going to need to, um, I think the easiest thing for me to do would be to scan the assignment portion of this book. The information you might need or read out of the sixth edition, I'm sure, is just fine. Um, publishing companies make authors rewrite editions just so they can kind of make more money and so forth. But the material, it's not like it's changed. The material in there in terms of explanation is just fine, but I will scan the questions in this book um, in the eighth edition. So you're at least doing the correct questions. Um, but the question is, how many of you need that? I mean, do you need that? Send me Put something in the chat if you need that. I assume, I'm assuming at least half of you do because I sent you the wrong ISBN number. Maybe you got lucky and saw eighth edition and went and looked for the ISBN number yourself. The ISBN I sent you like two months ago, screwed up. So let's see. Yeah, lots of you have the sixth edition, cool. So I will, I'll put that in my open math, I'll scan, and I'll probably do like the entire book, you know, right away, and I'll put the whole thing in there. So I am really sorry for that. That is dumbness on my part. So 
So that'll be a minor hiccup. Why do I keep going to the same place? There we go. So let's see, I guess what I will probably, so then on a daily basis after class, I'm going to post the notes. So you'll click in midterm one and there'll be like lecture, lecture, and then notes. So the only reason I say that is the things that I write in this class, I'd, I'd rather you be present, like don't feverishly write stuff down. Anything I'm writing down, you're going to have access to. So I'd rather you, you know, you might need to write some things down. Obviously writing helps, helps you process and so forth. So I'm saying don't write anything down. But I'm saying I'd rather you err on the side of asking questions immediately. Even if, even if it turns out it's like, oh yeah, I guess I knew that. Fine, who cares? Like, let's have a conversation. Let's not have a monologue. Um, I want you to be thinking with me, thinking about what I'm doing and saying, wait, hang, hang on a second. And, you know, maybe I make a mistake and you catch it, or maybe there's just something you don't understand and you, know, you want to slow down. Please, please do that. I want you to interrupt. Don't raise your hand. I'm not going to see it. Um, interrupt and say, wait, 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 I don't understand what you just said right there. Why does it work that way? You know, please do that. We have a small class. Let's take advantage of that. So that'll be sitting in here under midterm one um, by date every day or right after class. And then in homework, I have a place where you're actually going to scan and send me your homework. But at the top of this after class today, at the top of this, I'll go in there and scan all of the pages in the eighth edition. So I'll say eighth edition homework pages or something like that. Scan all those and send them in there for you. And then the projects I'm going to assign later on, I wouldn't look at those now just because they'll be confusing, but they're already in there. And then there's test review already in here. And the tests that we're going to do are going to be in here. They don't show up now because for you, their date isn't correct yet. Um, but that's what you'll need from this. Um, any questions about that? Feel okay about the structure of the class? So would homework one be all the homework for chapter one? Do they kind of go in chapter segments? Um, no, it's not. It's actually oh, okay. it's like kind of a chunk at a time. Mm -hmm. So homework one in this case is all of chapter one. Okay. But notice homework three has the first part of chapter four, and then homework four is the second part of chapter four. So sometimes it's all of it, sometimes it's not. But basically, you're just going to turn that into me all kind of at the same time. But you're more than welcome, like after class, any any day, like let's say tomorrow, let's say tonight you go home and you do question 16 and you're not sure if it's right. And so tomorrow after class, you say you stay after and say, hey, I got I got this answer for question 16. Is that right? I'm more than happy to answer that. You know, show me your work like this is not a test. Homework is designed to help you understand something. You're more than welcome to get together with each other on Discord and go over what you each did and discuss it that is so valuable or to ask me after class or just to say I'm stuck on question 16 I don't even know what to do what is it asking you know can you give me some hints about that please please stay after class and ask me those questions are we going to skip 1.1 um it's an introduction section I'm not giving an assignment about it but I am going to talk about it so I want you to understand okay. it I just don't think it's worth assigning that's kind of why I took it off the off the list Okay, let's launch. Let's see. I'm just scoping out chat really quick. Sometimes I will see that and sometimes I will not. All right, I'm sharing a screen and we will get going here. So what is a differential equation? Fortunately, that, that is easier than it sounds. Um, differential is the word you knew from Calc 1. Differential is kind of one of the least common ways to say derivative. If I, if I just said this class is not called differential equations, it's just called derivative equations then maybe you would feel good about it. A derivative equation or a differential equation is nothing more than something like this. So this is really 1.1, by the way, it's, it's just an introduction. It's something like this. If I said y prime plus three y equals 18 x, that is a differential equation.
and I'll explain. This is a, a sterile canned example right now, but I'll explain a little bit about you know what, what these are and try to give you some background as to why they're so cool before we're done here. But that's a differential equation. Um, if I take if I change this into like a, a fourth power, like y to the fourth plus three y equals eighteen x, it's not a differential equation. What is it? What is the differential or derivative equation? It's an equation that's got a derivative in it. Um, Again, y prime looks a little weird because it looks like y to the first power. So, I mean, you also got to think of that as you know, dy dx. That's another way of saying derivative, the derivative of y with respect to x. It's just an equation that's got a derivative in it. That's all a differential equation is. And so why they're so powerful is I hope you understand conceptually from, from your time and from your teacher's good job explaining calculus that this whole concept is really about change. In other words, how, how y is changing with respect to x. And so there are many examples in the world where you don't know the thing itself, you just know about change. For instance, what if I said the temperature right now is rising two degrees per minute? That's a pretty common statement, right? Like the temperature's going up, it's gonna be a hot day, temperature's raising two two degrees per minute. How would you write that down? I mean, you could write it in English, right? Temperature is changing two degrees per minute. Temperature is increasing two degrees per minute. Wouldn't this be the same thing as, well, D, do you want a differential equation that describes it, or do you want like a like a like a, okay, never mind. Yeah, that's probably what you want. Yeah, like a like the two degree per minute like notation that you just wrote before the equal sign. But yeah, yeah, good job. Continue. <laughs> a mathematician, thank you for for speaking up. That's exactly what I'm after. Um, a mathematician in terms of writing this down as an equation would write it down as well, dt, dt. That's a little weird because I guess we'd have to say t is temp and lowercase t is time or something like that. dt, dt is two. Like that's a differential equation. So anytime all you know is change, that's a differential equation. If you said, wow, that car was going 80 miles per hour, that's a differential equation because what you're talking about is, is how something is changing. Hey, the population of that town is decreasing 500 people per year. That's a differential equation because you're talking about, you know how it's changing, but you don't know about the thing itself. Does that make sense? If I say that town is changing by 500 people per year, it's decreasing 500 people per year. That's cool to know, but it doesn't tell you everything you wanna know because it kind of depends on, well, what's the, what's the population now? Is it like 500 million? Is it 800? I was in the town of Merrill, Oregon this weekend for this cool bluegrass concert. Town, population 800. If it's losing 500 people a year, that means in a year and a half, it has no people left anymore. So the initial conditions are really important. But the point is, a differential equation is change. Dif derivatives are change. And so if you reference how something is changing, you don't say about the car, hey, that car's at mile marker 97. You say, hey, that car is traveling at 60 miles per hour. That's a differential equation statement right there. If all you know is about the change, that's a differential equation. So, hey, look, differential equation. It's got a derivative in it. That's all it is. For short, people often call this class DiffyQ. So, What do you do with this? Like, okay, great, we have this differential equation. What is it we do? Well, the thing, the reason that, well, I mean, let's just take this temperature example. If I said, hey, the, the temperature is increasing two degrees per minute, that's cool to know. But what you'd really like to know is like, okay, great. But what I'd really like to know is what's the temperature at one o'clock today? Because at one o'clock, I'm gonna go out and mow the lawn or go to the lake or something like that. Does it make sense we don't, we don't have a way to answer that just yet? So let me give you a kind of a sneak preview as to where this is going. 
if I take this equation right here and I simply multiply dt to the other side, does it make sense that now you can take the integral of both of these and get rid of the derivative? That's the gist of this class. We, we are stuck in the real world with a differential equation because all we know is how something is changing, but we'd really like to get rid of the derivative because then we have an explicit equation that tells us how time and temperature are related to each other. And notice this is really easy to do, I hope. And this is why really calc two is the main, is the main uh, prerequisite for this class. We're certainly gonna need calc one as well, but calc two is the main prerequisite for this class because we are stuck with something that has a derivative in it, then we're gonna to need to take the integral. The fundamental theorem of calculus is the opposite of a derivative is an integral. So we're gonna take an integral to get rid of it. So I'm doing that now. Notice this is the integral of one with respect to capital T. Does that not grow a uh, capital T? The integral of one is X usually, but in this case, that variable is T. And on the other side, that two grows a T as well. What's missing from this that is extremely important in this class? The constant. Maybe plus C. Plus constants. Both sides actually have one. So I'm going to call them plus one, plus two. Does it make sense to you that I could, if I wanted to, subtract C1 over to this side? And then isn't constant minus constant just some other constant, some brand new constant that's different, like C3 or something? I'm just going to call it C. Does it make sense that this is much more useful? Because now I can know the temperature related to the time. Well, only if I know the initial conditions. Notice that constant is really important here because it depends with what it is right now. Just like I said about the town, if you're losing 500 people per year, if you're in a town of 2 million, who cares? That's a drop in the bucket. But if you're in Merrill, Oregon, 500 a year, the initial conditions of the town make a huge difference as to what's actually going on. You can't tell, you can't tell what the population of the town is next year unless you know what the initial conditions, that's the language of this, of this book is. And so let's say that, let's give it some initial conditions here. Let's say that at time zero, the temperature, well, what's the temperature right now? We're going to say it's 81 degrees. So I'm saying it's going up two degrees a minute. Notice that's ridiculously fast. I should be saying something like two degrees an hour, right? It's going up two degrees a minute, and right now it's 81. Oh, okay. So you're saying down here that the temperature has got to be 81 at time zero. Oh, okay. Then that means C is 81. And so now I actually have an explicit equation. So this, the, the previous equation was useful, but this one's re actually useful, really useful. Does it make sense? Now I actually have what we in algebra, math, mathematics just call a function. The differential equation dt dt equals two was cool, but it wasn't that useful. But now that I have this real function, does it make sense I can know the temperature at any time? I can know the time at any temperature. I, I know what I, I can now use this to figure stuff out. Does that make sense? So this is the bulk of this class. We, we approach something in the real world where we only can create a differential equation, but then we've got to take the integral to get rid of that. And then we have an equation that we can actually use. Now, one, some language that's really important in this uh, discussion. What's that variable called? And what's this variable called? And I don't mean temperature and time. I mean a little broader than that. I am asking you to read my mind here. But what are those, what are those variables the from science? Is, the little t is independent variable, and the big T is the uh, dependent variable. That is exactly right. Does that language mean something to you? Does it mean something deeply to you? If it never has before, it needs to now. Why is that called independent? Why is this called dependent? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Because the, the, uh, the temperature changes as the time changes and not necessarily the other way around. 
like the the change of the temperature is dependent on the independent variable changing whereas ex- the time is not you, you you talk about a temperature at a time not a time at a temperature correct that's exactly right like one determines the other one is the idea so you, you're not free to you're free to kind of check whatever time of the day you want but when you do that you're going to be stuck with the temperature that came from that that follows from that in other words the temperature depends on the time of day right you don't say the time of day depends on the temperature. That doesn't make any sense. However, isn't that true in this case? If I said it was 92 degrees, wouldn't you be able to figure out what time it is? That's kind of cool. Um, and you may notice this is oversimplistic, right? Because it's gonna, this is a line and it's going to make the temperature 1,000 degrees by 3 o'clock or something like that. So this isn't very realistic. But can you see that this is useless without initial conditions? how important those initial conditions were right there, ultimately. We have to know that. If all you know is change, then you have to know what it started from or it doesn't really do you much good. Anyway, that gives you kind of a feel for what this is. Now I've given you the, you know, the simplest differential equation that ex- exists, I think here, and it's gonna get complicated as to how to unwind this sometimes. Um, and probably this example up here would would give you uh, give you some trouble. Let's copy this down below. Duplicate. Where did you go? It's not where I wanted you to go. I've noticed uh, old people aren't very good with uh, touch on cell phones. And that would be me. Let's see, duplicate my I'll drag it with the pen. That works better. Okay. So can you appreciate how much more difficult this one's going to be to kind of do the same thing we just did? And let me rewrite the Y prime. Notice this should feel a little more comfortable to you because Y is the independent variable. I'm sorry, I said it backwards. Why is the dependent variable, our equations were always y equals with a bunch of x's on the other side. So y is the dependent variable and x is the independent variable. You may notice that this time this problem is much harder. Like how am I gonna take the integral of both sides? Well, I could multiply by dx if I wanted. Eighteen x dx. So taking the integral of both sides of this, I like the dress, it looks awesome. Um, taking, the integral, taking the integral of both sides of this, do you see that some of this would be easy and some of this would be hard? Do you see that? If I take the integral of both sides, is the integral of dy hard? No, because it's the integral of one. Is the integral of 18x with respect to x hard? No. Is the integral of 3y with respect to x hard? Yes. Very hard, frankly, impossible. Why is that? Well, what is y? Remember, y is some equation. Isn't that what we just found a minute ago? Like back here, t was some equation. It turned out to be 2t plus 81. In other words, y could be the natural log of 2x minus 7. That could be what y is right? Like we don't know what y is. Y is some equation. The whole point is the answer to a differential equation is not six. This is the answer to our differential equation before it's an equation. The answer is an equation in this section. That's the whole key. And so in our case, y could be, y could be anything. Y could be natural log of 2x minus 7. Y could be 3 times the sine of x squared. I mean, it's like, so how are you going to take the integral of a function when you don't even know what it is? Does that make sense? I can take the integral of 18x with respect to x because I know what it is. It's 18x, but what's y? It's not, it's not just y. You don't go, oh, it's y squared over 2. No, because you're taking it with respect to x. Had this been a y, no problem. Then I'd be able to do it. You see the problem here? So hard. 
that's where we're going in this class is like you're going to be able to do that problem before we're done but i got to show you some tricks it's, there's some there's all kinds of tricks and techniques and brilliant ideas that nerd nerdy mathematicians have come up with to be able to figure this out um, what you're going to start with in 1.2's assignment is actually you're just going to be given the answer and then asked to verify that it's actually true i'm going to give you the answer to this no no turns out this one is yes y equals 6x minus 2 is actually the solution this is the solution to this differential equation i would ask you to think about this for a second can you verify that that's true this isn't that hard but rather than just immediately do it for you i want you to think about that for a second could you plug that in and show that eh, sure enough those are actually equal wow cool let me give you a second i'm supposed to shut up at 10. Is there a special name for the differential equation where it's just like the derivative is equal to the constant? Like, like I know this one's linear. Like, um, no, I think not. Not other than what you would ordinarily say. In other words, this solution okay. is linear. The one I proposed was natural logarithm. The second one I proposed was a trig right. expression. Meant, like, so. I, um, the uh, dt dt equals two, like if that type of differential equation where it's just a derivative equal to the constant, if that had like a name. There like is a little bit works. of, yeah, there is a Sorry. little bit of terminology and I'm gonna go into that right after this, um, but no, okay. specifically to what you're saying, if it's just equal to a constant, there okay. isn't a cool. that I'm aware of. So you should say, okay, um, this is a set of directions, dy, dx. Well, that's the derivative of the y equation with respect to x. Well, when I look down here, the derivative of that equation with respect to x is just six, isn't it? So that's six plus three times y, but we now know that y is six x minus two. And the question is, at this point, it's still question mark, is that really equal to 18 x? So I continue and I say six plus 18 X minus six equals 18 X question mark. Oh my gosh, the six is canceled. Sure enough, yes. So I don't know why. Sure enough, yes. So that's the solution to that differential equation. The question is how would we be able to get that given that I think I did a decent job helping you understand we got a problem here, this is difficult. So that's the bulk of this class. How do you solve a differential equation? Number one, even better probably, how do you, what, where are they? Like, how do you, where, where are differential equations in the world? I'm gonna show you that right now. And then secondly, if you found one, then how do you solve it so that then you have an actual, and this would be called in math, math lingo, an explicit, an explicit solution that now we can use to figure out X anytime we know a Y or Y anytime we know an X. That's why we want a solution to this. So these things are kind of cool. Let me, let me show you just to quickly some cool examples, not from your book, from, but from a different book. I'll, I'll actually highlight this one a little bit for you in a second, but the Malthusian law of population growth. This is a classic one. Um, and we will make some use of this in this class, but dp dt. What in the world is that doing there? dp dt. What do you think p and t stand for in this example? Population time. Population time. And notice, and, and, and you should be able to think about this. Because the P is on top and the T is on the bottom, can you tell which one of those is dependent and which one of those is independent? You need to get good at this. P is dependent and T is independent. Correct. P is dependent. Population is dependent on time. 
And that's not just because in common sense you would say that, it's because the P is on the top of that derivative. So the P is the dependent variable and T is the independent variable. Is time always the independent variable? That's a, great, that's a great question. The answer to that is typically yes. Typically, you know, in, in real equations, time is is the one thing we kind of don't know. If you say, well, you know, how much money do you have? Well, it depends on the time. Back in this day, I had this much, and now I have that much. In the future, I'll have that much. And so time is often the independent variable in the practical version of these equations. But you'll be given random practice problems, but it'll say something like D, G, D, H, you know, and you don't even know what those stand for. And it's just some random problem. And so you'll have to know that because it's D, G, D, H, the G is the independent, I'm sorry, the dependent variable, the one on top is the dependent variable, the one on the bottom is the independent variable. So the question is, could we solve this? Could we solve this one? And in, in this case, you might guess um, that R stands for rate. And so a second ago, I showed you a, a time temperature one where the temperature change was a constant. Well, this is a temperature change that's like a percentage. Isn't that kind of realistic? And so if a population was growing, and this is a great example of what a differential equation really is, because I can write on this. Because that might be something like, well, let's make it negative. Let's say that the population is dropping at 3%. So that rate of change is 3%. Would this be a differential equation that you could solve? I will just ask you that. Let's see if I multiply dt to the other side. If I take the integral of both sides, is that? Is that easy or hard? It's hard. It's hard because that's not a T. Does that make sense? Remember what P is? P is some equation. Could, Could be P equals the natural log of T. Could be P equals the cosine of T. We don't know. So I can't take the integral of it if I don't even know what it is. Do you understand that? Could you just divide it over to the other side and integrate it with respect to P? Is that David talking, by the way? I only see some of you. Yeah. Got it. David's question is, could I get the P over to this side? Like so. Now could I do it? I could. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, like I, I think you could. Yeah, he's right. And so that's part of the that's part of the the mystery of this is like, how do you go about doing it? And, and he's exactly right. And I'll do this quickly for you. But anybody remember what the integral of one over P is from your calculus knowledge? Isn't that natural log? Natural log. Well yeah. done. Integral of one over P is natural log. What about the other side? What's the integral of 0 0.03 dt? 0, 0.03 times t. Times t. And again, both sides would have a constant, but I'll just cut to the chase and give it to this side. <laughs> this is an implicit solution. Do you understand why it's called implicit? That's because I haven't solved it for p. It's not p equals, it's the natural log of p equals. It's an implicit solution to this, to this equation. But again, it's still cool. Does it make sense? I got rid of the derivatives. It's not a differential equation anymore. And now I have an equation that tells me how time and population are related. Is this equation useful? Almost. Almost. Good answer. Because I don't know what C is. If I don't know what C is, then it's not useful. Do you understand that? Like it's almost useful. What do I have to know? Well, I'd have to know something about the initial population. That's why it's called initial conditions. Initial is because because it's basically at time zero. <laughs> I needed to know what happened at some point in time. It doesn't have to be time zero. I could say the population in year 2007 was 18 million people, and then I would have a condition. Um, but usually the time, it'll be initial condition, which is time zero. Are you, so, allowed to, um, are you allowed to make it explicit by solving for P? Absolutely, yeah. So an implicit solution would be this, an explicit solution, maybe your algebra is strong enough to handle this, would be you raise the other side to the e power. Yes? Right. 
Now you have an explicit solution. Almost feels like you could solve this one just by looking at it. <laughs> like the, the DP DT equals RP. Yeah. Now you should recognize this equation as something that was thrown upon your person back in algebra a lot. You were given this equation as a model for exponential growth for things. And you may also remember just as kind of a neat side note here algebraically that wouldn't this be the same as e to the negative 0 0.03t times e to the c? Oh, then it's a constant. And then if you say, hey, this is just some other constant, it's like a brand new constant now, I'll call it c1 just to change it. Then you, you could say p equals c1 e to the negative 0 0.01 t and now it now it looks exactly like what was just given to you in previous classes people just told you hey here's the equation that models exponential growth and you said okay but when you take differential equations you're the creator of these things does that make sense you're the person that actually invents the equation in the first place notice where it came from isn't that beautiful it just came from the simple recognition that the population is dropping three percent per year per day per month whatever and couldn't you get that yourself? Like if you just went outside and measured how many animals you had, and then a week later you measured how many animals you had and you found the percentage yourself, then you would know the answer to that question. And then that would result in this equation here. Before this class, you were just told this equation as though it came from nowhere. But this class is about, no, make these things for yourself. If the only thing you have access to is how something is changing, fine, write it down as a differential equation but then solve the thing, solve the thing so that now you have this equation. And you may notice at t equals zero, doesn't this whole thing go to one because you have e to the zero. Therefore, this term you may have memorized was kind of your initial, initial amount. You were maybe memorized that in an earlier class. So if I gave you some initial condition, like I said, at time zero, the population was 12, then C1 would end up being 12, and then you'd have a, a genuine useful equation that would tell you the population anytime you want it. That's really cool. So that's a simple one, and it's even doable. Um, as far as terminology, I'll get into this later on, but, but this particular equation is called a separable. There's terminology here because unfortunately, how to solve these things, it's amazing how how complex and beautiful and crazy some of the methods are that I'm gonna show you in this class as to how to tackle these. And because each method kind of depends on the type of equation, you have to recognize that. So this one's called separable. And the reason it's separable is because we are able to separate all the P's on one side and all the T's on the other. We are able to get them all on the same side and therefore we are able to go ahead and take the integral as we already know how to do. So that's a whole section will be, it's like three point two or something, I don't know, we'll get there. Um, kind of powerful. Um, let me just show you a couple other ones. I love this one. The Gateway Arch in St. Louis. This is a, not a great example of it, but it turns out that, and this is one of our projects, it turns out that there's a curve called a catenary curve that looks like a parabola, but it's actually if you hang a string between your fingers or a power line outside, I'm looking at 20 of them out my window right now, those are hanging in not a parabola, not a circle, but in something called a catenary curve, as this points out. And so what is the equation for that catenary curve? The only, and you could go look this up online right now, but the only reason we know it is because of that differential equation. Now, let's not analyze it and get, get I'm not gonna figure out what A and C and L is and all that right now, um, but why is it a differential equation? Derivatives. It's got derivatives in it. What's weird about this one, though? It's got that D2. That's a second derivative. This is a second order differential equation. That's part of the terminology in 1.1 that I'm not going to assign to you, but I'd like you to gain a working knowledge of. That's a second order differential equation. Does it make sense we're going to have to take the integral twice to get rid of that? So. When I say second order, that's the that's the fact that it's a second derivative. So we were just we just looked at a first order differential equation a second ago. Does that make sense? Everything I showed you up to this point was a first order differential equation. That's a second order differential equation.
immensely practical. Let's see, what other ones do I wanna show you? Oh, I love this one right here. This one right here is beautiful. What, do you, what, what would you call that one? Fourth order. Fourth order. A fourth order differential equation. We're gonna have to take the integral of this thing four times if we're gonna actually produce a usable regular function. What does this one model? Oh, I love this one. Got a project about this for you that you're gonna either love or hate. <laughs> if, this differential equation models the vertical displacement of a point lo located a distance from X on the fixed end of a beam of uniform cross section, blah, blah, blah. You future engineers, if you take a, if you put a beam across a, a river or a road or something like that, that beam is going to bend down, right? Even under its own weight, even before you put cars on or wherever that beam is going to bend down. Does it make sense as an engineer? You should know that ahead of time. Like how much is it going to bend down? Um, you need to know that. Well, this the, the solution to this differential equation is, is the algebra equation that allows you to know that, figure that out. And this, this differential equation is where it came from. In other words, the only access you have to this very important problem this affects every single person. Even if you don't like engineering, you drive over bridges. I went over the top of Lost Creek Lake yesterday going kayaking up in Prospect. Oh, it was awesome. I'm like hundreds of feet above going over the top of this bridge. And maybe I don't like math. I don't know anything about math, but I'm sure glad whoever calced out that bridge knew that. This differential equation is in some respects the backbone of our society. Everything that we support with a beam, which is all over in every house and certainly in bridges and buildings and so forth, is based on the solution of this differential equation. Um, this is probably my single favorite math problem of all math problems I've ever looked at, just because it's so practical. And I, I like houses and house plans and stuff. Let's see. Anyway, I, I won't look at all these examples with you, but, but notice there's a second order differential equation. Notice that's another way of saying a second derivative right there. So there's a second order differential equation. Notice how complicated that one is. Isn't that like, what? That's actually practical. You gotta be kidding me. What is it? This is just one mean looking equation concocted by the author. Hmm. Yeah, no wonder that didn't look applied at that. What is that thing? Do you have a preferred notation with the derivatives that we use? No, I don't care. Um, Usually, you're going to have more success if we do what we did here, because did you see how we were able to separate that? If that was just written as p dub p prime, does it make sense? It would have been harder to take the integral of both sides. So I'd say you're probably going to have an easier time most of the time if you wrote it as dp dt rather than p prime. Is that Leibniz notation? Uh, gosh, that's a good question. I want to say yes. I want to say yes. That was Leibniz's idea. Good for you for knowing that. I just read it in a book somewhere. <laughs> um, let me show you one other just kind of fun example. I don't think I'll go into this because maybe I'll come back to it in a little bit, but but this is kind of fun. Um, this is a picture I took out an airport window a couple of years ago. Um, What's with all these weird looking curvy lines? I don't know if you ever thought about this in terms of an airport, but it's like, here's this yellow curving line. And notice there's another kind of a curving line right there. It's all these weird curving lines everywhere. The traffic lines for the planes when they're taxiing around. Yeah, can, can you picture that driving a plane in a, in a, on the road, if you will, in the airport is rather difficult because you're actually sitting in the front and you can't see very well. So it's not like a car where you just kind of go, oh, I'll make sure my mirrors miss and so forth. What they're doing with these is they're they're putting their front wheel. It's just somebody's put some thought into this, and it's like keep your front wheel on that line, and you won't knock anything over. Like it's pretty simple, right? It's a pretty good idea because your wings are sticking way out there, and you can't really see all of that. Um, I don't know if this makes sense to you. Take a look at this picture. This is really interesting. But but watch what happens here. This is a good picture I took of this. So here's this plane, and he's doing or she's doing a good job of keeping the front wheel on this line. Does it make sense if the pilot just steers it in such a way that the front wheel stays on that line? Does it make sense that the back end is gonna swing over and line up with that eventually? And it turns out that like, how long does that take? That's a differential equation. Let me show you, let me show you how. Like we're gonna, we're gonna build one. 
I'll build it for you just by kind of us thinking here for a little bit, because I just want to, again, all I really want to do today is to show you a few things, but I just want to play a little bit, kind of help you sort of think about this world of differential equations. I can't remember what's on this YouTube, um, but I'll post this. So if you want to click on it and watch, I can't remember what I put on there. It's been too long. Um, but let's just think about this for a second. So I'm going to call this this d I don't know x dx dt. Why would I be calling that dx dt instead of like seven or something like that? Because it's a vector that's changing. Yeah, that's actually the speed of the plane. In other words, depending on think of it as a car, depending on the gas pedal or how much juice you put to it, the plane is traveling at a constant speed and so maybe that is maybe that actually is a number like four meters a second or something like that so the plane would be traveling at a, a constant speed does it make sense that this distance right here i'm going to call that s does it make sense that distance is going to change too so as the plane kind of works its way along this direction does it make sense s will get smaller and smaller and smaller in order for the plane to finally line up with that line and then you know take off straight and so forth so since that distance is s and it is changing does it make sense i i would need to call that dsdt can you see the I don't know the form, like the only access I have to this is about speeds. It's like the speed of the plane, which, which might be a constant. You might know that four meters per second, but how fast is that distance changing? Well, let's say the distance from that spot on the plane, and by the way, that's where the wheels would be. Let's say that distance, I think I'm gonna do it this way. Let's say A B is eight meters. Notice that's not a that's not a differential equation or something like that's just a, that's just a statement of the dimensions of the plane. It's eight meters long, twenty four feet long, to the front of the plane, right there. So I'm looking at this right triangle now that's made here, and I'm thinking, hey, I think I see a proportion here. Uh -oh. everything okay now my, my computer just went blank for i think it's fine the camera froze it happened last term i switched to a new computer and i still haven't figured out <clears throat> what's going on with that but, so you see me and see the drawing and everything is we're, we're okay your camera is frozen though okay camera is frozen can't see your face tell me if you can see writing yeah my camera looks frozen so look at the proportions of this. Would you agree you could say S is to eight? Yeah, we can see that. As DS DT. Oops, thank you. As DS DT is to, well, I guess I could just put four in there. Do you see that proportion? So basically, this side is the lengths of those two sides of the right, whereas this is the speeds. So I'm sort of saying the length of the lines is proportionate to the speeds. The point is, that's a differential equation, right? Why? Because it's got a derivative in it. It's a first order differential equation. And so, of course, the goal here, because the distance s depends on time, the goal would be to find, to find s as a function of t, the s distance as a function of t. And ultimately, what you'd like to know is when s is 0. Does that make sense? s is 0 would mean the plane lined up. In other words, I'd like, I'd like to know kind of how long it's taking for the back of the, tra the, the, the plane to follow suit. And by the way, this applies to all kinds of things. If you're in a boat and you're pulling a water skier behind you and you decide to turn the boat, 
does it make sense the skier is not behind the boat anymore like the boat's going another direction but eventually they'll line up behind them or maybe you're driving a truck and you've got a trailer behind it you've watched maybe semis try to navigate through the city and so the, the front of the truck takes a turn but then the back of it kind of lags behind it eventually catches up and of course that's really important because you're knocking over signs and pedestrians and stuff if you don't understand kind of that lag time between those two but you can see why in an airport they said hey this is pretty complicated let's just paint a bunch of lines on the ground and tell the pilot to just keep their nose on that line and everything will be great and you don't have to do math and differential equations to figure this out the point is the only access you have to this problem has a derivative in it does that make sense and so now our goal as i showed you here would be to say okay great well let's take the integral and get rid of that and then let's have an equation let's let's have just a normal equation that we can now use to talk about, you know, how long is it going to take for this to line up and, and so forth. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that right now. I'm going to solve this one, but I, I think you could solve this one in the same way that we did a minute ago. If you can get, if you can separate all the S's on one side and all the, all the T's on the other, I think you could solve this differential equation and actually get a, an explicit solution that would then allow you to say, okay, great. What time is it? How much time has passed and you know where is s now um technically if you do want to play with this for good what am i going to do about this let me just take a second and make sure my ipad is on the right yes it is Yes, it is. Hmm. So I think what I've done now is give you a reasonable idea of kind of what a differential equation is and the pro and on why the solution to it is an equation. The solution is never seven. The solution of a diff differential equation is never nine. It's an equation. And also maybe with this example, kind of where they come from. So all, unfortunately, all I really know anything about in this example is the speed of the plane. I know some things about the speed. And of, of course you would say how fast the distance S closes to zero, you would say, well, it depends on how fast the plane is going. Well, anytime speed is involved, that's a differential equation essentially. So now we can solve this. And so that's, that's the gist of what this class is really about. So let me give you a little bit of just, terminology from 1.1 that I'm not assigning um, just because I would like you to, to know a little of this. I think I better go back to my regular note sheet for this. Terminology, that's important. And again, the only reason I would say this is important and I'm not a terminology person is because depending on the type of differential equation, we're going to have a different way to solve it. So as I said before, one of the things we'll tackle later is a separable differential equation. So if it's separable, then, then you know how to solve it. There's a certain way to do it. Um, for the most part in this class, we're gonna be solving what's called ODEs, which is ordinary, an ordinary differential equation. Simply put, that just means no partial derivatives which doesn't mean anything to you right now. Um, if you're in Calc 4, it'll mean something to you about one month before that, uh, about three weeks before that class is over. There is such a thing as a partial derivative. Um, just to give you a tiny bit of background to that, a partial derivative is, is a partial change. Like let's say I was trying to lose weight. Does it make sense? There's a lot of factors that could affect that. A couple of basic ones would be exercise and diet. So what if I changed my diet, but I didn't change how much I exercised? Does it make sense that the equation as to kind of how much I'm going to weigh over time would, would have to have D for diet and E for exercise in it as, as part of its variables? And so what if I said, well, the only thing I'm going to change is my diet. I'm not going to change my exercise. I'm going to see how that works. That's a partial derivative where you just say, I'm only going to consider the, my weight change with respect to diet, and I'm going to ignore exercise. That's the idea behind a partial derivative. So we're not going to do this with partial derivatives. Um, also, there's only one independent, and that 
that kind of relates to what I just said, one independent variable. So my weight loss depends on exercise and diet. Well, that's not an ordinary differential equation then because that's two independent variables. Do you see what I mean? So our equations are only gonna have P's and T's in them, for instance, not P's, T's and R's. So can you go beyond this to a deeper level? Yes. That's why this class is, you might see some place in the book. We, you don't need to know this. This isn't a part of what you need to know to get things correct in this class, but. And I mentioned this second, I, I mentioned this already, and I think you understand this, but order is a second one. So there is first order and second order differential equations. And we even saw fourth order that pertained to beams a minute ago, but you need to, you need to understand that because, so the number of derivatives, we'll get into solving second order differential equations in a little bit in this class. And that'll be a certain technique. We'll have to use a different technique for them. So we need to recognize, ooh, that's got a second order. Oh, we're gonna have to take the integral twice. We need to recognize that. Thirdly and finally, we need to understand what a linear differential equation is. Um, I don't think I'm gonna go into this in great detail, but I'm gonna write something down here. Notice the weird way that's written. Do you see where the twos are? It's like D2Y DX2. It's like, why are the twos written in different places? That's meant to be the derivative of Y with respect to X twice, but it's not squared. So, you know, a nicer way to write that is just writing it as Y double prime, right? So I'm writing out just a random differential equation. So would you agree that's a second order differential equation? Would you agree it's also ordinary? Why is it ordinary? Because I only see y's and x's. Y is the dependent variable, x is the independent variable. Again, that's because the that's because the x is on the bottom. That makes it independent. Y is on the top. So I only see one independent variable. So it's an ordinary differential equation. It's a second order. And it's linear. What makes it linear? Um, it's a linear combination. Say that again. It's a linear combination of yeah. derivatives. Yeah. yeah, the derivatives themselves, it's, we're looking specifically at the derivatives. If this had been squared, like you may remember seeing in your arc length formulas, then it would not be linear anymore. Linear means it's only to the kind of the first power. Notice over here, this is not squared. That's a second derivative. That's not squared. Again, don't, don't worry about this. This is why I didn't assign it. We'll, we'll talk about this when it comes up. But it turns out if you can recognize, hey, that's a linear second order linear differential equation, there's a technique for it. So we'll, we'll talk about it when it matters. I just want to at least introduce the first part of this to you. Second thing is, is notice what's in front of them. Notice this is a, a second derivative. This is a first derivative, and this is no derivative at all. There's no derivative to that one. But yeah, look what's in front of them. This is important. What's the coefficient? X, X, constant. If this right here had been a Y value, as you saw a second ago, that's not good. It's not linear anymore because of that, and that would make it You'd have to use a different technique or it wouldn't be solvable. So the reason the first chapter boringly introduces this with a bunch of terminology and why I'm kind of skipping over it a little bit is just because it, it matters how you're going to solve it. So we're going to be able to solve this in this class. We're going to be able to solve this linear second order differential equation. We'll be able to solve this one. That's the basics. You don't need to know more than that for now. So let's not do any more than that. Okay. So now let's just maybe tackle some, some examples. So let me give you this one. dy dx equals 2xy 
plus 3y. This is not practical. It's just a boring example of a differential equation. Based on what I just said, can you say something about this? Can you, can you name that at all? Could you describe what type of differential equation that is a little bit? Is it separable? That's a good question. Is it separable? I That's think not, if you not obvious, but it might be. Go ahead. What was your comment on that, David? If you divided the y from the 2x plus 3, or you factored it out, and then you divided it over to the other side, then I think you could separate it. Yeah, David's right. If you, since both of those terms have a y in them, you could factor the y out, and you actually would be able to get all the y's on one side and all the, other, all the x's on the other. So this would be a separable differential equation. You could actually solve this one yourself. So it is separable, and that's important to recognize. Now, fortunately for you, when we get to the chapter on separable differential equations, because by the way, that's the easiest type, every problem they give you will be separable, and so it won't, kind of won't be an issue. But you know, if, you just, if you're just given a random problem and someone says, solve this, um, then you have to be able to identify, hmm, what technique am I going to use? Right now, you have no techniques, and so it's kind of hard to you know, talk about that. Um, I think you would agree, well, it's ordinary. It's an ordinary differential equation. Its order is one. It's only a first derivative. It's a first order ordinary differential equation. It's also linear. Why is it linear? Well, there's no squared derivatives. Notice the coefficients. This coefficient is a one. The coefficient in front of the y, which doesn't have a derivative, is an x term. That's good. The coefficient in front of this y is a constant. So there's nothing weird going on. So As wait, I said, go ahead. Um, but if you divided the y over to the other side, then there would be a y kind of thing multiplied by the derivative. Would it? Um, is that not not nonlinear? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll I'll answer I'll answer that in just a second. In other words, if there had been if there had been like a you know seven x squared in front of this, that's okay. That's that's the independent variable as the coefficient of the derivative. Fine, no problem. It's still linear. If this had been a y in front of this, then all of a sudden it's not linear. And again, the only reason that's important is just because we're going to be using a different technique later to solve it. If it's linear, then we'll do one thing. And if it's not, we'll do something else. Um, to David's point, if I, and I'll just mess with this a little bit as a preempt for something future, since both of those have a y in them, and then if I divided this y over to the other side, in a sense, now that the coefficient in front of that, the way I wrote it now, all of a sudden there's a coefficient in front of that that's not that's the dependent variable, not the independent variable. Then all of a sudden it's not linear. So the question is, is it linear or not linear? It's like it is linear if you write it this way, and then all of a sudden it sort of looks like it's not if you write it the way I did below. Again, I consider that to be ultimately splitting hairs. The only reason for this terminology is just to decide how to attack it. So don't get worked up about this. This is not a test question. I'm not going to say, is, the, is this linear, ordinary? I'm not going to ask those questions. Again, that's kind of why I skipped that section in the, in the book. So then that first, so it is linear. Then. Yeah, this one is. OK. But we wouldn't solve it by like we would a linear differential equation. We'd solve it using separation. Okay. Yeah, this one ultimately, we, if you could recognize it as separable because you can get all the y's on one side and all the x's on the other, then we'll be able to do it fairly easily. You could solve this right now based on based on that little introduction I gave to that. Um, so let's just do a couple things. Notice, notice in a sense what this is telling you, and we'll get into this more tomorrow ultimately, but this tells you how to find the slope. Isn't that interesting? It's like it's like a set of directions that tells you what the slope is. Do you notice that? In other words, if I said, hey, I'm at the point, uh, I don't know, uh, three, negative two. Do you know what the slope is at three, negative two? Well, yes, you do, because up there, doesn't it say that the slope is equal to 2 times x times y plus 3 times y. And so what is that? Negative 12 and negative 6, it's negative 18. Isn't that true? If you want to pick any point on the graph, you can find the slope at that point right there. Let's do it to some other point, like 1, 4. 
So that'd be two times one times four plus three times four. That's eight plus 12, which is 20. And so notice if I'm at the point three, negative two, I have a really steep negative slope. If I'm at the point one, four, I have a steep positive slope. Notice this is kind of cool because it's like ultimately remember what we're trying to find. Our ultimate goal is to find, in this case, y is a function of x. We want to find the equation without the derivative in it. We want to take the integral and get rid of that derivative. And it's interesting, like if I was to graph those two points and the slopes that go with them, does it make sense I could actually see a curve a little bit and like I can, I can actually look at the curve even though I don't know how to find it for myself. That's kind of the, the idea here. We'll, we'll, we'll elaborate on that a little bit tomorrow. Really section 1.2 and this you do have an assignment over and I already gave you an example of this is just verifying solutions. In other words, the idea is we're not smart enough, smart enough yet to find them for ourselves. So if somebody gives them to that to us, could we verify that it's a solution ourselves? So as I said, you might be able to find this for yourself based on the fact that I already showed you a little bit about separable equations, but, but I, let's just see if we can do this. So you verify this implicit solution. And here it is, natural log of y, looking at my notes, equals x squared plus 3x. I'm going to give you a second to try that yourself. So could you plug that solution in to the original differential equation back up here? Could you plug it in and determine, huh, look at that, those are equal. I'm not smart enough to find that solution myself, but sure enough, that actually is a solution. Again, I'm just going to give you a second to think about it. Can you still take the derivative of this from calc one? Yes. The derivative of natural log of junk is one over the junk times the derivative of that junk though. So I'm just taking the derivative of it just like it sits. And the only reason I'm doing that is because the original problem has a dy dx in it, so I need one. So I'm gonna take the derivative of this to do that. So implicit equations are harder to take the derivative of. You got to think chain rule. The derivative of natural log of junk is one over the junk times the derivative of the junk. Again, I could have wrote that as y prime. You're probably used to seeing it that way. Maybe I'll, for now, switch and even write it that way. The derivative of the other side with respect to x is much easier because they're x's. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of 3x is 3. So would you agree then that y prime, if I multiply y to both sides, equals y times 2x plus 3? So y prime or dy dx, whatever you want to call it, is y times 2x plus 3. So now that I know that, does it make sense I could go back to the top and say, OK, well, then let's see, is, question mark, is y times 2x plus 3, which I've just substituted in right there, really equal, question mark, to the other side, 2xy plus 3y. And notice if I distribute the y, 2xy plus 3y, oh, it's the same exact thing. So 
check, true. So that was a solution. I'm not smart enough to make it myself, but if somebody proposes one, I could, I could check to see if it works. And by the way, this is kind of important to do because you're gonna to have to find these for yourself, the, mo the majority of this class. And so if you wanna know, hmm, I wonder if I got this right, you can do what we just did, check it. Hey, look at that, it works. You don't need me to grade this, check it. It's not the only way to do this. I wonder if it would be I wonder if it would be different if somebody had asked us to verify this explicit solution. And I, I hope algebraically you could look back at this expression and say, hey, I can solve that for y really easy by just raising the other side to the power where e is the base. Would, would that have been easier for you to verify if that was the case? Again, I have the same problem I had before, which is, well, if that's the equation, then I'm going to need dy dx to verify this, right? And the equation had a dy dx in it, so, so I'm going to have to go find that. So let's go find that. The derivative of y with respect to x equals, what's the derivative of e to the junk? From calc one? E to the junk. E to the junk. It's the what's same stuff. Say? I think it's the same plus um, the derivative of e to the junk is e to the junk, but chain rule says times the derivative of the junk. I have no problem with you asking me calc one and calc two questions, by the way. Don't I mean, it's it's that's why they're prerequisites to this class, but that doesn't mean you walk out of there an expert in all of that. There, there should be fuzziness in your understanding of Calc 1 and Calc 2. You probably only took it once, maybe twice. So the fact that you don't remember this or don't feel very good about it, a lot of times the second time you look at things, it's a really good idea to ask why questions. The first time you were just kind of hanging on for the ride, but the second time it's like, well, why do you do that? You know, maybe you've forgotten, like, why does the chain rule work? You know, that kind of thing. Those are interesting questions to ask. So, okay, well, that's the derivative. Whoa. So then you're telling me the question then is, is that question mark really equal to the other side of this? Now that I, now that I found the derivative, is that equal to 2xy plus 3y? Doesn't look like it, does it? Do you see that that's not as terrible as it looks? Given that this is really what we called Y, right? If I just replace that with Y then isn't it equal? Oh, look at that. Y times two X plus three, that'd be two X Y plus three. So, hey, I got it right, so to speak. Later in this class, it'll be like, yeah, hey, I think I found the solution. Remember the solution to a differential equation is an equation, not a number. I think I found a solution, I'm all done. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I got that right. Well, go do this and check and see if it's right. That's really a lot of what 1.2 is about. Hmm. True, check, they are equal. It is a solution, awesome. How about this? Again, these are 1.2 examples. I'm trying to do things that'll prepare you for the book assignment. Can you name that? Can you look at that and go, oh, differential equation, it's got a derivative in it. Oh, not only that, it's a second order one because I've got to take the derivative twice. That's a second order linear differential equation. We don't know how to solve that. Well, yes, we do. This is separable. You could do this yourself. This isn't hard at all but we're pretending we don't right now. 
verify that C1T cubed plus C2G plus two equals zero is a solution. You should not be surprised by those constants. Why are those constants there? Because when you take, when you have a differential equation, you gotta take an integral. When you take an integral, it brings constants into the problem, doesn't it? Again, I just wanna give you a second to think about this because this is not obvious. Verify that's a solution. So for d2g, do we take the integral twice? Exactly. So we gotta we gotta somehow take the integral of that thing twice. And then set our answer to that equal to 8t and kind of hope they're actually equal. Does that make sense? Or show that they're equal? Well, notice that second equation is is not g equals it's an implicit equation it's not solved for g g is the dependent variable t is the independent variable we're staring at this wishing this was g equals and then t's on the other side right an explicit solution we we're wishing that but it's not it's an implicit solution but i'm gonna have to take the derivative twice in order to plug it into the equation above right so you got two choices. You can do what we just did and you can take the derivative like it sits, like we did here, because you're good at taking implicit derivatives or couldn't you solve it for G yourself? Like, why can't you just solve it for G? I'm gonna take that approach. Can't you solve that for G? That's not hard. So let's see, wouldn't that mean G equals, I'd have to subtract C one T cubed and subtract two. And then I'd have to divide everything by C2. Like, isn't that's hard to solve for G? I'd rather take the derivative of that twice. That's what I'm thinking. And it is important to understand that C1 and C2 are constants. You get to treat them like constants. We just don't know what we don't know what they are yet. So what is d g d t i gotta take the first derivative before i can take the second so that's just t cubed and notice the c2 just really comes along for the ride and there was it'd probably be easier to think of this as one over c2 times negative c1 t cubed minus two in other words the one over c2 just comes along for the ride so i can just kind of ignore it it's a good thing because otherwise it'd have to be thinking quotient rule and something nasty like that, right? Yeah. So this really isn't that bad. So then power rule, three comes down front to be multiplied by whatever that C1 constant is, it reduces by one. And then the two just disappears, doesn't it? Because the derivative of two is gone. So there's the first derivative. And again, you could just pull all the constants out front if you want to, you don't have to just pull the C2 out there. You could say, I'm gonna pull them all out there. Negative three C1 over C2, that's the huge constant coefficient times T squared. So then if I proceed to the second derivative of this, which again, we write, so it doesn't look like it's an exponent. This is not an exponent. It's just saying take the derivative twice, but we're reusing the, the symbols of exponents to do it. And so that's why it's written the way it is two derivatives of g with respect to t. So then it's just power rule again. The two pops down front multiplied by the negative three to become negative six. There, I did it. I found the second derivative. So now I can say, hey, is that equal to eight t? So I can say, equals question mark does that equal 8t notice the answer is well no well yes as long as c1 and c2 are certain numbers does that make sense like this isn't going to work unless c1 and c2 are certain numbers so c1 and c2 can't just be anything so let's see i guess the answer would be yes 
if, have you seen this terminology? If and only if, that's a mathematical statement. Yes, if and only if negative six C1 over C2 is equal to eight, or I guess I could divide over by six and say C1 divided by C2 then would be negative eight over six or negative four thirds. As long as C1 over C2 was in that ratio, so that means C1 could be negative four and C2 could be three, but C1 could also be negative eight and C2 could be six. C1 could be negative 40 and C2 could be 30. So it doesn't like they have to be certain numbers, but the ratio of their numbers. So yeah, it's a solution, but only if the constants are certain numbers, it's not just anything. Now, let me show you kind of the way, the, again, this is not hard, but your, you know, your book will word it in such a way that sometimes you'll go, what is it asking me to do? I don't understand what I'm being asked to do here. Um, let me, let me, so that, maybe we'll just write it this way. So the, the book might say it might will give a problem that looks like this. One of the problems I assign looks like this. It'll say verify this as a solution. And it won't just stop there. It'll say verify it's a solution with these initial conditions. Notice there's actually two initial conditions. One of them is at time one, it's two. Notice these aren't really times because the letters, well, I guess it could be T is T is time. So at time one, there's two, but then it also says at time one, the rate of change is four. So what does that mean? Well, let's think back to what we just got a second ago. So we had this a second ago. That had to be true, right? We're saying that's the solution, but we haven't found what C1 and C2 are yet. So let's consider that. Well, if that's true, that... So let's consider the G1 equals two condition first. Well, that means when T is one, G is two, right? So I'm gonna plug that in to that, to this top equation up here. I'm just gonna plug that in. So C1 times one, I'd leave that off, but I just wanna make sure you saw that I plugged it in, plus C2 times, well, G, but G is two, plus two needs to be zero. So really it's C1 plus two C2 plus two equals zero. That's kind of the nicer way to write that down. So notice, notice that does not give us this, that doesn't tell us what C1 and C2 are. And by the way, just logically, if you have to take the integral twice, wouldn't that create two constants? You take the integral once, there's a plus C, you take the integral another time, now there's another plus C. So that would make sense that there'd be two C's here. Again, I'll show you practical problems that involve this later on in this class. Oh, we're gonna have a matrix we're gonna solve, huh? Exactly, so this has got two, but then there's a second condition that we're given, that initial condition that when the derivative at evaluated at one is equal to four. In other words, dg dt is equal to four when t is equal to one. That's what that's saying, right? So I've got to take the derivative of it. I did that earlier. We found the derivative of it. Where was it? It was right here. It was right there. Duplicate. Drag that unit down here. Except I'm going to cut to the chase and get rid of all the ugly parts of this. And just consider this. Oh, okay, so that means for us then that 
dg dt is 4, negative 3c1 over c2 times 1 squared, or I guess I could say 4c2, I don't like fractions, is equal to negative 3c1. So don't I have a system of equations then with those two noted equations that I could then solve? So now I'm going to actually be able to determine C1 and C2 as a result of this. So let's see. I don't like pain. How do I avoid pain? I avoid pain by taking that top equation. Do you have this kind of creativity to your thinking? I see that I have a 4C2 here, and I'm looking up here thinking, gee, I wish that said 4C2. But couldn't I make it 4C2 by just multiplying both sides by a 2? So then I can replace this 4C2 with C1. That's a nice way to do this. I didn't have to use a matrix to solve this. I certainly could have, for those of you that took linear algebra. So that's C. That means I have negative C1 plus 4 equals 0. So that means C1 equals negative 4. And if C1 equals negative 4, and I put that in back here, that'd be 4C2 equals 12. Then doesn't that mean C2 equals 3? I think I have that right. I feel like I have this backwards for some reason. Just double checking my thinking really quick to see if there's anything I did wrong. Isn't the T cubed? Yeah, did I lose that? That was squared. It wasn't cubed, it was squared because it was the derivative. But because I put one in for it, it didn't matter since my t value was one, whether it was squared or cubed kind of didn't change anything. I did a matrix and I got um, C1 equals negative four and C2 equals three. Okay, so, so I think that's it probably good. It's fine. But it's easy to make math mistakes, right? I mean, it's like, you know what you're doing. But it's easy to blow this. I'm just doing what you should be doing, which is stopping and thinking a little bit. Go slowly. Just stop and think. Is this right? I'm not, I'm not sure. So then I think the solution to this is, since the original solution I was given was that, I, th I think I, you know, I can just plug in what I know now, right? So I can say negative 4 t cubed c2 was 3 plus 3g plus 2 equals 0. And then I could do what we just did a minute ago. By the way, did you notice what we did a minute ago just happened to be true? Didn't we say a second ago that this would be true if and only if c1 divided by c2 is negative 4 thirds? And did that happen here? So we sort of know this is going to work. I don't have to redo this. But but the question in your assignment will say will say kind of like like this. It'll say verify it's a solution if g one equals two and g prime one equals four. And again, you could you can understand that it's like I don't understand what you're asking me to do here. But do you see how that allows you to actually find a particular solution to this? So this is a particular solution. And then I could take the second derivative of that and plug it in and make sure it equaled 8t and all of that. And that'd be nicer, wouldn't it? It'd be nicer to do that with numbers instead of c1 and c2. Incidentally, because this is terminology that will come up later and will blow your mind with the beauty involved. But let's see, where was that solution? This right here is actually not a particular solution, but what, what we'll call a family of solutions. And you're going to be blown away by how cool that is in a little bit. But, but right now, C1 and C2, in a sense, could be sort of any constants. There's lots of possibilities for that. And so that's a whole family of solutions, different solutions. And, and until you know the initial conditions, that doesn't 
that's when you settle on a particular solution. Does that concept make sense? Like earlier when I said, hey, the temperature is rising two degrees an hour. Um, well, that's a whole family of solutions because if right now it's 50, that'll create a different equation. If right now it's 20, that'll create a different equation. So when we said that was 2T plus constant, that's a whole family of solutions. As soon as you have an initial condition, then you can get a particular solution to that. Does that, does that ring true? Does that feel good? Does that concept make sense? Um, yeah. that, we're going to use that a lot. That'll, that'll make sense to you as we cruise along, and especially in light of what I'm going to show you tomorrow. That'll make more sense. Let's just do a couple more examples. Uh, let's see, book. Let's do book number five. What is book number five? I don't know. I wrote down that that'd be a good problem to do. Again, I'm choosing these based on things that I help. I think will help you get your assignment questions right. So here's what five says. Five says, determine whether the given function is a solution to the given differential equation. So here's the given differential equation. They say that dx dt. I immediately know when I see that, that x is the dependent variable, t is the independent variable. And they're saying, if I take that and I add tx to it, and that's equal to the sine of 2t. Would you agree that's a pretty complicated differential equation? Again, it's really simply differential because there's a derivative in it, but that's a complicated differential equation. Now, because you recognize what are the independent and what are the dependent variables, do you understand the kind of answer I'm about to write down? So the book is saying, verify that this is a solution. I like that it says verify. In other words, this isn't a trick question. It's, it's a solution. Like if you don't get it to be a solution, then you screwed up. No, that's not true. It says determine whether it is. So it may not be, I'm wrong. Verify or check is X equal cosine of 2T. Right. You shouldn't be surprised. It says X equals with T's on the other side, right? Because X is the dependent variable and T is the dependent variable. Did I say that right? T is the independent variable. X is, de X is dependent, T is independent. So is that a solution? I'm gonna give you a second to think about that. I wanna do this, this and one other example. That's all it says. There's no initial conditions or anything. It just says verify that that's a particular solution. If I plug that in, if I plug this in up here, it's actually gonna be equal. I don't want this to be steps to you. I want you to look at that and think, oh, that top equation has a derivative in it. So if I'm gonna see if those are equal, I'm gonna to have to have a derivative. Hey, look, I have an explicit solution down below and I can take the derivative of that. It makes sense. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, but it doesn't seem to me like it's a solution. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, maybe it's not because because again, I, the the way I wrote it, I said verify. That's not a good. The book said determine whether it is. Maybe it isn't. They're they're not saying it is. They're not. So I don't I actually don't know. So let's find out. So I'm going to start catching up to you. So let's see. Dx. And maybe that that doesn't feel very natural. You're not used to seeing x on top. The derivative of x with respect to t. Notice you're really, 
you're actually taking the derivative of both sides. That's that's the best way to think about this. Is like, like if you took the derivative of x on that side, what's the derivative of x with respect to t? Well, it is the derivative of x with respect to t because remember you don't know, it's not a t, so you can't say it's one. The derivative of x with respect to t is the derivative of x with respect to t. You don't know what it is. On the other side, however, it is t's. So you can take the derivative of that because it's made of t's. So now I'm gonna take the derivative of the right side. Um, you should have a cheat sheet from calc one. Maybe I'll post one. I should do that. I'll post That'd one. That'd be nice my, to get another one. My note sheet, I'll, I'll post that in my open math for you because you, you may not remember that. What's the derivative of cosine of junk? The answer is negative sine of junk. But chain rule says you're not done. That's why I use the word junk. The derivative of a cosine of junk is negative sine of junk, but chain rule says times the derivative of the junk. So there's dx dt. Okay, great. Now I have dx dt. And so then I can stick this in up here and now I don't have derivatives anymore and I can sort of check to see are those equal. So the question is now is negative two sine of two t plus tx equal to question mark I don't know yet equal to the sine of 2t hmm sure doesn't look like it although I see sine of 2t's that's kind of good maybe I could subtract them from both sides and so forth um it's kind of hard to tell for sure but remember you notice or remember you know that x is also equal to this which means I could replace x with cosine of 2t there if I wanted to, because right now I sort of can't tell. I don't even know if this is a good idea. I'm kind of, I'm floundering around right now as, as, as you should be too. I mean, my, I didn't get something simple, right? I'm looking at, this doesn't look equal, does it? I, I sort of don't think it is right now. But, you know, trig's a little dangerous, right? There's all these identities where you can switch stuff into other forms and like, uh, this could be tricky. This could be a trick question. Now, this is, maybe these are equal. I can't really tell. I don't think it is because I don't think you could get a T out in front of the, I don't think pulling a T out, you know, with any sort of identities would get a T in front of the sign on the other side that would somehow like, make it equivalent because there's a t in front of the cosine so if you were to add the two the negative two sine two t over you would get t cosine two t equals sine or three yeah. sine of two t and i don't think there would be any way to multiply it by that t yeah that's that's good intuition and that's my intuition as well david i agree with you the fact that there's a t in front of this is kind of a problem does it make sense it's going to be hard to get if that t wasn't there then maybe i can combine sines and cosines and get them equal and so forth but that t there feels like it's going to be Kind of damning not going to work um but of course i don't feel very good about this so i don't know i want to play with it a little more just to kind of maybe be sure for instance if i added that two to the other side wouldn't that be equal then to three of them that's kind of helpful isn't it so i have two of them and now one more of them that's three of them um i guess i could divide by divide both sides by three if i have sine of i'm just thinking out loud here but if i divided by so it's by cosine maybe you can see why i did that what's sine divided by cosine identity tangent. Tangent. tangent so now it looks less equal like is the tangent of 2t equal to t over three that doesn't look equal anymore and now i can kind of tell like that's not true i mean it might be true for certain values of t but remember, t is not a number. t isn't six here. t is, well, back to here. t is an equation. It's part of an equation. It's a variable. So, nope. So that's not a solution. So, you know, later in this class, if you did all your math and got that answer and you're wondering, hmm, I wonder if I got this right. Well, you didn't. <laughs> it didn't work. You didn't get it right. How would you like us to indicate that something is not a solution? Should we just write nope? <laughs> um What's wrong with I mean, that? The, the more mathematical way would be to go not equal you know something like that mathematicians okay. like symbols for things so i don't care but does it make sense in this case some of you could have if you will maybe had the intuition to go you know nope clear back there say not equal clear back there 
Um, but that's a little dangerous with trig, but I think at least where I got, but no, we're not all gonna get to the same place here. Does that make sense? We're, we're, we're gonna stop different places, I think, with a problem like this. So basically, yeah, so, I mean, in theory, you could solve that equation and get a value for T, but you're checking to see if the, if those equations for T are both equal. Yeah, so see, that has to be equal for all T's. In other words, not just, yeah, this is equal okay. when T is seven. Okay. Because back here, this is telling us T is not seven. Does that make sense? It's more complicated than that. You want to get that the same thing on both sides. Say that again, David. You want to get the same thing on both sides, Ben. And like yeah. T over three is not at all tangent of two T. You would have to have specific values of T that would make that true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those, that's a very good question. Both of those points are very well taken. So this, this, yeah, this was, could be equal for certain values of T, but in this case, we really need both sides to be equal and you're not going to get rid of tangents and T's. And so I need three T equals three T or the tangent of T equals tangent of T or, you know, something like that to say, okay, yeah, that's true for all values of T. Yeah. At first I thought it was a trick question and it was just T zero. So that would, would be equal. Correct. That's right. If t is zero, these would actually be equal. But no, we need the entire equations to be the same. And so, you know, again, you, I hope yeah. you have enough curiosity to you to think, well, dang, that's not the answer. I wonder what it is. That's is there, is there an answer to that? Can we get it? Is there some some way to solve that? And that's what the remaining weeks of this class are about. Is like, can you actually solve that one? Is there some way? And you can appreciate that looks pretty complicated, doesn't it? Looks like a lot's going on there. And, this one isn't separable. You're not going to be able to get all the T's and X's on the same side. And so, you know, is there some trick to this? Is there some way to do it? You know, I got all kinds of amazing things to show you in this class. There's something called the Laplace transform. It's so cool. We could use a Laplace transform and perhaps solve this. I've got so many neat techniques to show you. Yep, I've stuff. heard about that. Super cool. Super cool. Let's just do one more book example and then we'll be done. Let's do question nine and 1.2. Let's see, what does it say? It says the same thing, determine whether it's true. It doesn't say it is, doesn't say it isn't. It says determine whether it's true. The differential equation that we're trying to ultimately solve is dy dx equals, it says two xy over y minus one. That's the differential equation. And their wondering question mark is this. And this time it's an implicit equation. And again, notice it's y's and x's, which is kind of our home turf. And so you should expect y equals a bunch of junk with x's on the other side. But unfortunately, in this problem, they're saying, no, it's actually an implicit equation. In other words, we're not solving it for y for you. And you may notice that actually would be very hard, if not impossible, to solve for y, because there's a y and a natural log of y. So is that expression a solution? Again, I want you to notice that that's what solutions to differential equations look like. They're equations. They might be implicit, like this one is, or they might be explicit, like the last one was. I think the last one was explicit. Yeah. Yeah, it was. So is that a solution? Again, what we're going to have to do is take the derivative of our proposed solution so that we have something to plug in here. So I'll just give you a second to see if you can still do that. You're going to have to take the derivative in that form to do it. Can you still do that? I need to shut up here, so I'm not going to give you very much time supposed to be done by 9.50 and I'll always be done by 10, but it's going to be somewhere between there. Fair warning. That's fine because vector calculus starts at 10.30, I think. Yeah, yeah, there's a little lag time. So you can stay after class and ask me questions if you want. That's good. We couldn't do that last term. It kind of sucked. Nice. So let's see, what is that derivative? Well, the derivative of y, notice I'm, I'm finding the derivative with respect to x. So the derivative of y is the derivative of y. 
I'm looking at this right here. I'm just taking the derivative of both sides. That's what you always do with algebra. Do the same thing to both sides. I'm taking the derivative of y. It's not one. Why? Because I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. Remember, y is actually some equation. Y is a terrible equation made of x's, and I don't even know what it is. I kind of know what it is because I'm staring at it there, but I don't have it solved for y. And you can't solve this one for y. So the derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative of y with respect to x. I'm writing it as y prime this time, but I could write it as this. What's the derivative of natural log of junk? One over the junk times the derivative of the junk. That left side is terrible. The right side, easy. Why? Because it's made of x's and I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. What's the derivative of x squared with respect to x? 2x. What's the derivative of one? Zero. So I just took the derivative of both sides. That's a great way to think about this. Notice now I can actually solve, I can actually figure out what y prime is because couldn't I proceed from here to factor y prime out since both of these have a y prime? And then if I divided both sides, so y prime, which is also dy dx, if I divided it over, wouldn't this be equal to? There, don't I have a, don't I have an expression now for dy dx that I can now put in up here? And so now I don't have any more dy axes and I can see are those two messy? Wait, there's messy two things? y primes though. No, because I factored them out. There was two y primes right here. But I said, hey, look, both of these terms have a y prime. So I'll take it out front. I'll factor it out, oh, leaving okay. one minus one over y. Now I only have one of them. And that's exactly the beauty of that. Because you're right, Raymond, you don't want to have two y primes. So I actually right, I found see. what y prime is. Isn't that cool? Now, again, that was like six months ago, right? So you're not, you're not doing this as easily as I am, right? You're kind of going, wait, hold on. Oh, wait. So now I can kind of check to see. Now, the question is, is 2x over 1 minus 1 over y, question mark, I like throwing that question mark in there, really equal to what it's supposed to be equal to, 2xy over y minus 1. Again, it doesn't look like it, does it? Right now, it doesn't look like it. But you can't just look at it and go, no. Like you got to play with it a little bit, like simplify it a bit. So I'm going to, because I don't like fractions anyway, I'm going to multiply this one top and bottom by y. So that becomes 2xy over y minus 1. Oh, huh. huh. that's it. I'm done. They are equal. Check. So that is a solution. Wow. That's cool. Are there going to be situations with these problems where taking the integral of the other side is, is easier? Uh, let's see, that is a wonderful question. Like if you took the integral of dy over dx's equation right there. That would be separation of variables. So that would be finding a solution. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful thought. In other words, you know, do, we have, do we have to take this expression over here and take its derivative and plug it into this? Or could we just take the integral of both sides of this? Keep in mind, that's where we're going in this class. Like it, it's utterly ridiculous for and contrived for somebody to say, hey, here's a differential equation that's made up and comes from nowhere. And here's its answer. Like in the real world, it's more like you made this differential equation yourself because you were curious about how a trailer tracks behind a truck. And then you said, okay, well, that's great, but that's not useful. I need to solve that so that I have equations with y's and x's, not derivatives. And so you produce this yourself. And so, yeah, I mean, that's the focus of this class is you're just given something like this and you're asked to solve that. And so you will need to take an integral to do that. That's exactly right. Since it's got a derivative in it and you don't want it there, you're gonna to need to take its integral. In this case, this is separable. Can you see that you can multiply y minus one over to the left side and divide by y on the right side and multiply dx to the other side? You could actually get all the y's on the left and all the x's on the right, and then you'd be actually be able to take its integral. Yeah. Can you agree that 
that would not work. Let me erase this. But if I came in here and said plus x, you couldn't do it now. You would not be able to get all the x's and y's separated thanks to that plus x. And then that trick wouldn't work anymore. So that's what makes this class hard is like, how am I going to proceed? Well, I'll try this. Oh, that didn't work. Well, I'll try something else. That didn't work. I'll try this. That didn't work. Hmm, I wonder if there's no way to do this. Of course, in a class like this, I'm not going to give you problems you can't solve. But in the real world, like if you're making some, if you were trying to model something, you might create something that wouldn't be possible to do. So that's just an interesting part of this. So the idea here is, can you do that yourself? And then secondly, once you get an answer and you can appreciate, wow, isn't that a surprisingly crazy answer? That's a really weird answer. I'm surprised that's such a crazy answer. Then can you kind of check and go, wow, I, I got this right. That's pretty cool. So if that was a test question at the end of this class, if I said solve this differential equation and you not only got that answer, but then you did all of this and said, you know, wrote some smack talk over here saying, I already know this is right. You know, when you look at it, I had 20 extra minutes on the test. So I checked it myself. Bam, that's right. Count it. Um, for those of you that are curious, you might, you might try that. I'll just write this. Again, this is, I forgot what section this is in the book. I want to say it's not even until chapter three. Where is it? Separable differential equations or chapter two. 2.2, 2. separable equations. We'll, we'll be solving this in 2.2. Got a couple of other things to show you before we kind of get there. But, but let's see if I multiplied by, I think I'm going to erase this, but just that for those of you that are curious. If I multiplied both sides by y minus one, and I divided both sides by y, and I multiplied the dx over to the other side, do you agree that I was able to get them separated? And so now I can take the integral of both sides. And if I did that, apparently I'm gonna get this, since, since that's the answer to this. Apparently that's what I would get. I wonder if I can still do that. I wonder if my integral skills from Calc 1, I wonder if my integral skills, I'm sorry, Calc 2, I wonder if my integral skills would allow me to take those integrals. I wonder if I could actually do that. It's not hard, by the way. But I'll leave it at that. Okay, I will say this every day, but um, stay after if you wanna ask questions. I'll, you can always leave if I, ramble and you just need to leave you can just disappear but i'll always try to at least formally let you out let you out somewhere between 8, 5, 9 50 and 10 but you can always stay after and ask questions or just here stay after and see if anybody else has questions you might be interested in or stay after and say hey can we do that one that, that problem you just proposed could we do that really quick i'm curious i want to see if it works and i want this to be kind of an open-ended time All right, thank you, Doug. See you. And good to see you. I didn't know, Ben, that you knew uh, Steve Holst. You're friends with his. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. saw him in the coffee shop the other day. And so, what, which, which son of his are you friends with? Maybe more than David. one. David. David? Are you guys the same age? I would yeah, see he's just a little bit younger, so. but we're about the same. Cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Spoke highly of you, and I did as well. Thanks. <laughs> so do we know enough information to start doing the homework for section 1.2? Yep, you do. You should be able to do section 1.2 right now. My advice would be go do that. Like to start class tomorrow, like feel free to say, you know, hey, I couldn't get this question because maybe your question would help other people. Like but ideally you should be done with section 1.2 before we talk tomorrow because maybe maybe the knowledge that you gained there will help you understand the 1.3 section that we talk about. Often that's the case. So you don't owe it to me until whatever I said on the syllabus, but be smart to tackle that right away. Okay, sweet. And we just do it on a notebook and then send it to you as a PDF on my <laughs> Yeah, you're going to, don't send it to me now. Just save it till you get a few of them together. But yeah, yep. Just do it on scratch paper like usual. Okay.
Okay, thanks, Doug. Yeah, see you, Raymond. See you. Tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.